Welcome to the podcast, the destination for insightful discussions and interviews on the appreciation, conservation, and husbandry of reptiles with a focus on turtles and tortoises. Now, let's join our team of turtle nerds. Hello, hello, we are live, we are live with, a, with another, a, another exciting episode of the podcast. This is episode 70, and we are so excited to have with us Carl Franklin, who is the president of Texas Turtles. Uh, really, really excited to have him here. He is, um, as I was talking with Steve earlier, Carl is an academic who is super engaging, which is something that you don't always find all the time. Somebody who can really, really do the people side of it, but also has just a wealth of incredible knowledge and experiences. And we're just thrilled to have him with us tonight. Thank you, Carl, for being here. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to be here. And uh, hello, everybody out there in the Internet. You know, let me tell you guys something. We're doing this right now in a weekday, uh, you know, just before prime time. And it has been so long since I've done any kind of talk like this. For a lot of the viewers out there, uh, they might not be aware. This is the way that old school herp nerds used to come together. They'd have these Herp Society meetings and they'd be at like the town hall or the college or the zoo or wherever. And uh, you'd get there. It was like, you know, the third Tuesday of the month or something and not the most convenient time. But uh, it was a, it was a good break to have in the week and something everybody looked forward to. So uh, just hats off to y'all for continuing that kind of tradition. It's a it's a virtual fellowship you get to have with everybody. But uh uh, now I'm going to stop talking so we can get this show underway and we can start tearing it up on the turtle room. <laughs> I think it is underway. I think it's happening. Right on. Have you ready, right? You hear? Absolutely. I'm here, man. Kev's Remember, here. I'm in the chat too. So if I lose, if I lose glare, it's because of that. Are you, are you explaining to me or to Carl? To Carl and the okay, audience. Good. Okay. I just want to oh, make okay. sure. <laughs> okay. I felt like I knew that already. I wasn't sure if others did. Cool. See, Carl, I told you it would get awkward fast. It always does. So, um, Carl, can you tell me the um, recent experience you had with jury duty? Well, you know, guys, uh, Anthony's kind of going to like a behind the scenes sort of conversation we had. I was just talking with the boys and telling them <laughs> that uh, down here in Texas, Texans take their civic duty uh, very seriously. And... Uh, I got one in little letters in the mail saying that I was a lucky person to be selected for jury duty. So I went down to the courthouse. I'm waiting there. I'm waiting to see if my name gets called. And I'm hoping it doesn't. I'm kind of anxious. And, you know, you get that I sort of anxiety in your stomach and all. Well, I had to go uh, and, uh, and visit, uh, the restroom. visit the restroom. While I was there, while I was there, uh, uh, I'm there in the stall. I'm there in the and, stall. I need, and I need a little bit of tissue, little bit paper. Of tissue paper. And I reach over and, and I reach nothing. over and there's nothing. And, and it's like and, this, and old and this old Seinfeld episode, episode where, where not a square to spare. And uh, I kept, and, uh, I, I, kept well, I reach over well, that little metal box there and I did there and I did and I pulled it and out, I pulled it out and and it was this. It was this. <laughs> and I thought, this and is I not going to do me any good at a time of need. These pages are too glossy. Are too glossy. Sure, it might be sure, so it glossy. Might be so right. glossy. Uh, uh, and, and then, it, and then what happened what is, happened is uh, uh, Anthony, I got to tell you, I started looking through this, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm glad, glad. I went to jury duty. Because this is an excellent, excellent book. And and for those of you out there that, uh, 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 if I was moving, I was moving around, book around, too quick and stuff. This is the natural history, natural history, history care, breeding, and 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 Contact, contact and communicate, communicate and, and, and share, and ideas, share and ideas, ideas and knowledge. In fact, in fact, a lot of us got some. Got some <laughs> we've made some, <laughs> made some big, pretty big mistakes. mistakes. And, uh, and uh, uh, there was even one mistake that a prominent herpetologist made with regards to uh, uh, Spangler eye, and that was because he said that they occurred in Borneo. 
And so that had been published in some of the books and that inform that mistake got kind of carried down. But the mistake I'm proudest to uh, say that I was affiliated with was uh, uh, I went and I looked at the literature cited section and I didn't see my name. <laughs> and then I realized, wait a minute, that's because Anthony probably knows how to spell G-O-E Mida correctly. <laughs> and uh, uh, so let me tell you guys another story. There was a magazine called The Vivarium back in the day. And it was, it, everybody loved it. It was great and popular and stuff. And uh, they had a uh, article on the cover and the, on the cover of the magazine, it said uh, Geo Mida Spingleri. And it, 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 it was that second E. And that uh, second E gets everybody. Then uh, uh, I got a, a scathing letter from a reviewer of an article uh, that I published in Reptiles Magazine. And they were chewing out the editor's magazine because I had misspelled it as well. And then I got to looking back and even uh, some of the zoo graphics back in the day were, were had the same misspelling. So, guys, not only do you get to have a resource these days put together by these folks that are out there uh, really tracking down obscure and uh, first-rate material, but you also get the correct Spelling, <laughs> which could be very handy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm blushing. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm like absolutely blushing. I really just wanted you to tell that story. So, so Carl had had given that to us, and our reaction was probably um, a lot more uh, animated the first time. But uh, I just wanted you to make fun of the book. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> I'm always trying to get Kevin to make fun of me on the show, and he never really takes the bait. But I do it in real life. You know, in real life. I know. Time. In real life, millions, it's almost reversed. Listen, for the millions of our viewers, I don't want them seeing it, you know? that's I don't mind. I, I love you, man. I don't think we're at millions yet, but we're working towards it. We're working. To, we got Carl tonight, so we're getting there. I feel, I feel, that, I feel that way anyway. Um, All right. Well, let's rock and roll. We're shifting. <laughs> So Carl, tell us tell us a little bit about your start. You we had um chatted before or um uh you had kind of let us know some possible talking points and, and a couple of those uh involved your your beginnings in um in the zoo field um and also just like herpetology and study and, and things like that. Um so you had mentioned how your um, career in academia, correct me if I'm wrong, started with bragging about your ability to sweep and mop. Can we talk oh, about yeah. that? <laughs> we, we can talk about that. Uh, so herpetology to me was this, this wonderful, fascinating thing. And then uh, whenever I was a kid, of course, there was no internet. Once again, back in the days of no internet at all. And uh, I'd read things in the field guides and talk about herpetological societies and so forth. And um, uh, I think the only reason why I lasted enough, long enough to uh, even get a grip into herpetology is because I had just gotten kind of used to dealing with rejection on a certain level. And uh, uh Frame the picture for you this way. Uh, my wife and I got married whenever we were 19 years old and we were living on our own. And whenever you're that young and trying to start on your own, things are really challenging. And uh, so a lot of the jobs that I had involved a mop and a broom. And whenever I wanted to get into herpetology, I didn't know who to talk to or anything. So the first thing I did was we went to the Fort Worth Zoo and this is uh, back in summer of 1994. And I, I told my wife, I said, babe, I got to I got to talk to somebody here. How in the world do you even get a job at a place like this doing this? And I, I, could, I didn't know how to get the attention of a keeper. So I just started tapping on an exhibit glass about a thousand <laughs> times and that will work. <laughs> and uh, I think it was Rick Hudson who came exploding out the door. And uh, I wow. said, uh, hey. How do you get a job here? And uh, he said, we ain't hiring, but you can turn in an application. So I did. And then uh, later on, my wife was reading the uh, university catalog and she said, hey, do you know that there is a herpetology museum here? What? 
And so I went down there and I saw a lady with some students in the collection room there. And I tapped on the door frame and I, I said, Hey, could I, and she gets up and bam, just slams the door right in my face. And I had long hair back then and it <laughs> blew my hair backwards. <laughs> and, uh, I thought, well, she must not be having a good day. I came back a week later and the same thing happened. And so, uh, I just thought, ah, I, I, I just, I can't back down from these turkeys, man. These, these look like some real nerds here. That, that, that's, uh -uh. So I went back and this time I stuck my foot in the door and I, uh, I had gotten work study, uh, funds at, through a grant at college. And I just said, uh, I thought I better get, say my piece before she slams the door. And I said, you have to hire me. Well, why should we hire you? there's nobody that's going to be able to sweep and mop these floors as good as me. <laughs> and they let me in. And, uh, and, and so that right there was the, uh, first big step into a downward, downward, downwardly spiral of poverty and fun. <laughs> poverty and fun. I love yeah, They got to go hand in hand. You know, there's like, there's nobody in the middle. They're either poor because they follow the animals well, or they're rich because poverty they turned us but uh, yeah. uh, you get to have some fun in there, it counts. So mm -hmm. right. that was uh, an amazing thing for me because whenever I was working in a museum collection, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that the very foundations that herpetology is uh, based upon, or a lot of the ologies involving organisms and things, is the knowledge that is created by what is in a museum collection. And uh, Boy, I got lucky. I happened to not only start at a good collection, but it was the largest of its type in Texas. And uh, just going through and seeing the material collected and then going and looking back in the uh, field journals of these folks and stuff and the, the, the pioneers of yesteryear in herpetology, uh, I just thought, I really, really want to do this. This is super exciting. This is really cool. I get to go out and find these animals that bring me so much happiness and everything and learn more about them and help other people discover. So that was great. Then I got hired after that. I wound up getting hired at the Fort Worth Zoo. And uh, uh, I think I started off with a little tiny metal uh, brush, little wire brush and uh, a water hose. And I was told to go clean out the tortoise building. And it was in the winter. And so the tortoises would uh, defecate all over the cement uh, floor. And they had pig blankets in there to keep them warm as well, and lights and all that. But uh, they would just make this disgusting mess all over the place. And these were young male radiating tortoises. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to devise a plan, a way. That, now, here is a, an advance in herpetoculture I'll tell you guys about. Uh, excuse me. If you just take a tortoise, and you clean that floor and stuff really good, and it's got wet water still standing on it and everything, mm -hmm. you put that thing back on it, you're not going to have a clean floor for very long after that. Mm -hmm. So we had a big sink in there, and I would just get a trickle, just a little stream of warm water, and I'd take the tortoise and place it on its back, and I'd let that stream just land right on the cloaca. Mm -hmm. uh, in a few minutes, it would relax, and you'd see the tail start to fill up with water. And uh, that would, I was basically giving tortoises enemas. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was something that really helped save the day. I'm not joking, yeah. because you're feeding tortoises constantly. Yep. Uh, they're going to be producing constantly. But uh, after that, I went to the Dallas Zoo. And that's where a lot really took off for me. And uh, I'm really fortunate that I was able to do that because the basics of, of uh, uh, herpetoculture and the husbandry practices uh, have just been really invaluable. Uh, the other part that I, I appreciated uh, was the uh, venomous reptile uh, training, handling. And uh, they were very, very scrutinous. Uh, back in the day, you'd get full access. A lot of zoos aren't like this. But back then, if you got hired at a zoo herp, you're expected to be working every section, every animal in the collection uh, sooner or later. And so you'd be under six months uh, probation. 
And if you sneezed, they could fire you. It was a clause that they had. And you had to pass a, uh, six exams. They gave you uh, different books you had to read and stuff and all this. But uh, uh, during the venomous uh, evaluations, you'd have somebody standing there just completely tearing you apart for every little tiny movement or where you're going with it and stuff. And so that that right there, I was really lucky. Uh, working venomous reptiles was something that's uh, been a constant in, in uh, uh, my career. And being able to have that professional training like that, I, I, I know a lot of folks kind of get by without it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm glad that I had it, though. It was, uh, it was really, really helpful. You, you touched on a couple really, really interesting points. Um, can you speak to, because I think a lot of people, this is like, that's just animals in general. If you like, you see what's happened to like animal planet and, and any type of animal thing that's, that's there for public consumption, right? The, the, the big, the megafauna, the, the sexy species and, um, uh, animals and, and topics and the dangerous things and all of that. But, but then you have places like Dr. Pritchard's uh, Colonial Research Institute that has all those specimens there for people to see. And folks aren't necessarily flocking to it or anything. I don't, I don't know necessarily how many people it could handle visiting at once. But just what are the important what is the importance of museum special specimens? Because you kind of touched on that a little bit. And and right. what should people realize about that part of the process? So uh, basically I'll just kind of walk you through it. Uh, uh, one of the things I was very fortunate to do is to be, is to participate in several, uh, major sponsored, uh, field events. And, uh, what I mean by that is that these are events that were paid for by the National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, uh, various faculty at the university that I worked with. Uh, they would they would have some of these trips and all planned for the to support the research. And a lot of the research that was being done was simply discovering what in the world was out there. And people don't really a lot of folks don't have the uh, the awareness or the grasp that we have got lots and lots and lots of new species of uh, of amphibians and reptiles and all kinds of other things that are awaiting discovery. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're out there and you're doing this type of work, you go to these places, you strategize. What we would do is part of the plan was always, we always had uh, our colleagues in the uh, uh, country we were working in were always very much tied to the project throughout the whole process. And uh, they would have their students, uh, we'd have our students, and uh, the whole thing is paid for and stuff. Then whenever you go out, you would go to places and you would collect specimens. You carefully record all the data. Those animals are brought back. They're photographed in life. They are uh, uh, humanely euthanized. And then tissue samples are taken and uh, the specimen is preserved. And then those are sent to the museums. Now, in these projects, what we did is we always split uh, the specimens collected so that the host country, they have equal representation in their holdings as well. And then we would always let them have the uh, types. And what a type specimen is, is whenever you go out and discover a new species, the type is the name bearer of that species. So for every turtle out there in the world, there's a museum specimen. Uh, I think in just about every case, there were some that were lost you know, long, long time ago, but uh, there's a type specimen and is the reference name bearer of the species. And uh, we'd get back from these trips and, and uh, you know, everything is done with miles. There, there's always lots of permits required and things like that. Uh, but we'd get back from these trips and the uh, students and faculty that were the big sponsors on them would, the next thing you know, you got uh, hundreds of species descriptions being put out. Uh, a friend of mine has been working in Indonesia, and I think in the first year of his uh, efforts there, uh, it was something crazy, like 300 new species. And uh, the first time that he visited Sumatra, he was finding, uh, I think it was a new species every six hours. And so 
that's the kind of uh, incredible rate of discovery that can be done. But also in places like that. Now I know a lot of folks are, oh man, it sucks going out there and, and uh, just getting these things and pickling them. Can't you bring them back? And uh, you have to be the grown up in the room on that, on that situation. Uh, whatever you put the, whenever you euthanize the animal, what you got to realize is that you're creating a resource, a tangible resource that's going to be available ideally into perpetuity, meaning uh, long after we're gone, uh, nerds, you know, if there's still <laughs> nerds around in 100, 200, or 1,000 years, they can look at that one little brown toad and uh, appreciate it for the scientific merit it has. And there's lots of discoveries that are being made <clears throat> with museum specimens. Uh, just the very fabric of how organisms are related to one another and uh, the closeness of them and what the better way to call them in some cases and stuff. It, it's, it's done a lot with using comparative material and then DNA samples. So uh, the molecular work, you know, you hear hobbyists often complain here and there about like, oh, man, they just keep changing the names and stuff. And uh, there is sometimes things that are done weekly, but uh, and by that I mean without a lot of strong support. But uh, uh, overall, I think the system is pretty good. And so museums, <clears throat> sorry if I'm digressing there, uh, they're, they're, they're the single most important resource for our knowledge and understanding of herpetology, and they're a cornerstone to conservation. Uh, so that was one of the things right there. Uh, for myself, I always enjoyed, and I didn't have any problem, I enjoyed going out for, uh, gosh, almost 20 years, I did a lot of uh, tropical uh, field collecting, and then uh, about 17 years, and then I got, then I just said, you know what, I'm tired of this, <laughs> and I'm getting beat up and stuff, and this and that, and I'm overall having fun, but uh, uh, man, I tell you what, there is not an alligator snapper living in the Amazon, you know, <laughs> there, there ain't the last I checked, there wasn't any giant, well, there were giant soft shells in Asia, but not many. Uh, so we got it good here in Texas. Yeah. And, right. Right. Uh, uh, you know, folks say, well, how many, uh, uh, species of turtles are in your state? And right now it's 30 something is what I'll say. Uh, I got a business. I got a business card with all of them on the back of it, and I just had that. But uh, but no, the uh, uh, the other thing was that I had like I got. I, I think I was really lucky. I got to have the full museum academic experience, and I had about uh, close to six years working in the zoos here. And so, boy, one of the things too I like to touch on, and this is different also. Uh, when I was at Dallas Zoo, one of the requirements that we had back then was we had to publish at least, a, or at least I did with my job title there. The other guys, all, everybody on staff did I'll tell you that everybody would at least have one peer reviewed publication a year. And, uh, we, uh, uh, figured that, well, it was a philosophy that was started by Jim Murphy and, uh, whenever he was curator there and it was kind of centered around the thing, like you got people with some skills and talent, uh, yeah. wouldn't it be better uh, exploited if you're letting them do things and encouraging them to get out there instead of just wiping glass and picking up turds and uh, feeding food? So right. uh, that was something there. I got lucky, man. That's incredible. Yeah, it, it adds a level of um, uh, like a official um, or, or um I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it definitely makes you, you feel, I'm sure, like what you're doing is important. It means something. And there's a whole bunch of people in the world who would like to learn from what we're experiencing every day, which is the truth. Right, right. right. The, uh, the, the reality is that you, at, at times, whenever you're doing it, and I'll just tell this to everybody, uh, and it kind of brings me on to a topic that I never hear anybody discuss, but at times you'll be doing it and you, you just go, man, you know, only me and like three other nerds in the entire world right. <laughs> care about this. And uh, <laughs> so you, you have to, uh, professionally, you have to remain relevant, but you also got to remain relevant personally. And uh, one of the things that I've seen happen with, uh, uh, I've seen it creep up on myself and I know other folks that it has. And you guys might 
have experienced some of it before is just the burnout that can happen. And so I bring that up because I've seen uh, also a lot of young people come into the hobby and uh, they <clears throat> they come in and they get overwhelmed. Uh, but the burnout part of it is something that uh, I think you have to successfully manage and stuff. Uh, Maybe that might be something that happens more if you're working day in and day out, nine to five, clocking in at the zoo and stuff, and you have to deal with work stuff related uh, on top of it all. But uh, at any rate, have fun. If you're not having fun doing it, then uh, you seriously need to think about getting out of it or doing it a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the take Absolutely. home. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I've I've come around to that myself um, in recent years. Just you want to add, you want to um, uh, to legitimize what you're doing. We all we want to work with animals in some capacity, and you want to legitimize what you're doing. So if you're keeping animals, then and I know you you mentioned the hobby as well and herpetoculture as well. Um, you want to legitimize that. So you're looking for reasons to justify it. Um, well, I think, I think you don't have to actively do that, but, uh, it, it's something that, well, for me, I never, uh, if I change something up to, uh, kind of rejuvenate it, the feeling or whatever, uh, right. it wasn't, it wasn't done with any kind of, I didn't sit down and have a plan or anything like that. Uh, but no, it's just a topic that that's uh, a good one to bring up because uh, I think it I think it's creeped up on just about everybody before sure. one time or another. But and that's what we lose, though. You think like, oh, well, I want to do this for conservation, or I want to do this for education, or I want to like I want to give back. It should be more, which is important because if we're turtle people, then we should care more than just what excites us, I suppose, because turtles are you know so threatened and endangered, so many species, but really just do what makes you happy. Right. Cause I think if you go out there and, and, uh, and you really get it into it, whatever it is with it, then you're going to be able to project from that. And, right. uh, uh, I'm, I'm flattered whenever people say things like, Oh, it's a good thing, what you're doing and stuff and all. Uh, but, uh, I'm just selfish and, and that's, <laughs> and, and it's a, it's a, it's a selfish pleasure. So, that's uh that's okay too. <laughs> right. And and see it's it's so refreshing to hear you admit it because it's you being you that means a lot but you know it's okay to own the fact that you're doing it because you enjoy it and it's not just like a calling necessarily it's an interest that will always be there that you can't run oh, away from. Yeah, man, I'm 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 a thousand miles behind some first responder or doctor or nurse or anything like that, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll be the first to tell you that, but, uh, let's move right along. We'll keep forging this path here. Uh, so Anthony, what you got on your notes? Oh, I've got lots on my notes. Uh, you spoke before about the, the divide between herpeticulturists and herpetologists. And that's something I'd love to get into a little bit, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. It's, uh, it's really plain. Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, a lot of herpetologists, if you go, like, for example, if you, uh, let's just pick one out of, out of thin air, William Duhlman and, uh, Duhlman turned 90 years old recently. And, uh, he was, uh, probably best known for, uh, amphibian biology and, uh, lots and lots of discoveries with frogs throughout Latin America very famous herpetologist. And if any of you guys out there don't know who William Duhlman is, uh, pick up a copy of Hylid Frogs of Middle America. It's an amazing book. Uh, you'll have a guy who can tell you the, uh, the changes of musculature in the tail of tadpoles as they grow. Uh, he can tell you the number of teeth that are on uh, uh, the jaws of certain frogs. Uh, he could go into all of that detail. But uh, he's never bought a single ounce of cocoa bedding in his life. You know, <laughs> the man's never owned a bale of aspen or anything. Whereas you could have uh, you could have somebody with a room full of uh, uh, snakes or turtles or whatnot and stuff. And and they couldn't tell you to save their mama's life. Uh, the name of the person that discovered that animal. So there's there's just two completely different 
uh, parts. Uh, that's just two different shades of the uh, appreciation there. And they're close. They're parallel. But they're 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 still just miles apart from one another. And uh, uh, so that's the other thing is that it's never been. Now, I'll tell you this. As a herpetologist, the thing that used to really kind of piss me off a lot was whenever I would take heat from uh, herpetoculturists, from hobbyists and all. And uh, if you like these things, then why are you killing them? And I would present the same question back to them. Uh, you know, if you like these mm -hmm. things, why are you killing them? If you go buying these animals that come in, you know, millions at a time and you got high mortality and stuff, then, well, you're part of the problem as well, you know. Uh, I'm not here to be finger pointing or anything, but I will tell you this. If you look at the last 300 years of museum collecting, I'm talking three centuries, uh, and you count all the specimens of reptiles and amphibians in the world's museums, you're looking at about 7 million specimens. Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Well, yeah, that was a loaded question. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every year for the last uh, decade, easy, uh, I think the number of amphibians and reptiles commercially imported, exported from the U.S. Uh, is, is over 12 million. So, and, and those animals, whenever they're, if they're wild collected, you don't have the notes where they came from. You don't know that. Uh, if they're, even if they're farmed, you know, so you have limited scientific utility with it and people say well gosh you know that's a fine specimen of a uh, king snake why wouldn't a museum want it and uh, a museum would probably turn it away without uh, knowing where it came from because right. if you don't have any of that information then what do you base your findings off of how how relevant could that be but uh, you know overall I think that most hurt people are are their view of it isn't it's centered on any kind of controversy at all. Those are just things that if you spent a, your your working career uh, in and out on this stuff, that you would um, come across that kind of conversation. That blows my mind, that number of, yeah, 12 million per year. But that's the thing that people don't realize is in terms of the animals in the wild, their their population – that when you take an animal out and remove it and now there's no data or anything, yeah, the animal's alive and the people who are keeping them in captivity would say, no, I'm trying to breed this and for, cap for, for conservation or no, it's that animal is now dead, you know, yeah. in terms of the population, yeah. it's gone. Yeah. It can't go back without knowing exactly where it came from, all the rest of it. And they're not actually thinking of, of the big picture and, and all of the, you know, uh, points from, from all directions that, that go into that. Uh, yeah. I think a tough part, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go right ahead, man. I was just going to say, I think a tough part is that people that get into the hobby, even for like, you know, the best intentions, you don't learn that sometimes. So later on, you know, you don't think about it until it's told to you, you know, then you're like, that's when the light bulb goes off. Right. Yeah. Cause most people aren't going to be willing to have a door slammed in their face two or three times and beg <laughs> to get a job because they can sweep. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, right. People don't want to be told what they, you know, what doesn't support their goals. But, uh, I will tell you this. So some of this work has led to things that did involve uh, being able to apply herpeticulture to it. And with regards to turtles, gosh, no, duh, I can't believe I hadn't touched on this. Uh, in 2006, I had the good fortune of going to Venezuela. Now, that might sound like an odd statement uh, for those of you that don't under, that don't understand the current situation in Venezuela, it's very, very dire. Uh, I think that a couple of years ago, the inflation rate was over 45,000%, meaning money is absolutely worthless. And uh, the sad thing is, is that there is a lot of cool stuff to be done out there regarding herpetology and especially turtles, uh, but it's not going to be able to get out there again until things stabilize and start to improve. Well, in 2006, we went on a collecting trip, and uh, one of our uh, uh, colleagues there, Hilson Rivas, is a major fan of herpetology and everything regarding herps and stuff, and, uh, and he's an academic there as well, and he had a gift for me, and uh, it was a uh, Maracaibo toadhead turtle, the Zulia toadhead, female, and uh, 
there was only one other one in the United States at the time. And so he said, here, I want to give this to you. And uh, we had our permits and everything ready to go from that trip. But that trip was a really rough one. And <laughs> we had at least one of us had uh, uh, was circled with machine guns at one point on that trip. But uh, we, we learned to kind of like not really care too much for the military presence. And we had a rental truck. And we go to the Caracas airport and I just parked the truck right in front of the airport doors. We get out and we're going to check our luggage and the soldiers stop us and they say, all right, what you got in these boxes? And so I had the Zulia toad head. Uh, it was alive. It still is. And uh, she was at the bottom of uh, placed in a container in the bottom of the box. She's listed on the permit and everything and stuff. But uh, all of the preserved material was on top just because you know, hey, let them look at some marine toads and some run over roadkill specimens that we pickled. And we got we got back. And then uh, I was able to go back again in 2007. And on that trip, brought back a male. And so I uh, was able to have the first uh, pair of Zulia toad heads in the United States. And I was very fortunate. They bred twice for me. And uh one of the things that uh, probably the biggest discovery that came out of that was um, that these turtles have a whole range of communication with one another that uh, no other turtles have, have done before. And uh, one of the special times that I got to see that was where I took a, a sibling, a brother and a sister, and they're about uh, five or six years old each, and I placed them together. And they've been separated for two years. Uh, they used to live together. And uh, they went through uh, almost like a dance. It was a greeting. They both came up and they put their heads to, towards one another. And then she put her hand out like this. And he put his hand. And they started waving the water towards their hands on the right side. And then they would change the position of their heads. And they would do it from the left side as well. And this went on for about two hours, this whole exchange of that. So uh, Peter Pritchard came by the house and he saw the turtles and uh, was really happy about that. And uh, uh, it was something that, you know, I never, I, I just got lucky. I never set out to say, hey, I want to go and uh, bring this right. back and stuff. But uh, uh there's, there's every now and then, whenever we'd be doing these types of uh, field work where animals uh, sometimes would come back alive. And uh, uh, certainly being able to do that in this case uh, has been really cool to uh, learn more about a very elusive uh, turtle. I mean, it's a, it's a side neck in South America that spends months underground. <laughs> and so that's just weird on its own. But uh, uh, at any rate, there you go. There's the Zulia Toadhead story without any of the drama. So <laughs> that's really, really cool. Steve had mentioned that you had spoken at the um, TSA conference about that project. Is that correct? Oh, I did. I did. Yeah. And I'm glad Steve was there because I think uh, that was about my audience at that talk. So really? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. Was... <laughs> like, there's, you know, they have different talks at the same time. And, you know, you right, never know. Right. Maybe, maybe everyone's. Maybe maybe everyone's out ready for leaving early for lunch or something like that, and it's not necessarily your fault. Um, now yeah. the uh, but you know going and, and doing stuff with turtles and uh, and and uh, well and in Latin America, you know here in Texas we got uh, our fine neighbors to the south, Mexico, and I recall uh, spring break two thousand three. Uh, my wife and I were in Del Rio, Texas. And I said, hey, let's just go drive to Mexico and see Coahuilan box turtles. She said, okay, do you know where they're at? And I said, yeah, they're in Coahuila. Let's go. <laughs> and so we crossed the border. <laughs> and I told her, I said, look, it's, we're looking at about a three or four hour drive to Cuatro Cienegas. It let's doesn't just, sound let's that bad go, to me. Let's just go fill up the car. We had a cooler with a few sandwiches in it, 20 bucks cash on us. And we just drove on out. And uh, I was about 30 miles from the place, and I didn't have a road map. And so I just uh, wisely 
pulled up to a police officer on the side of the highway. And uh, I asked him for directions. Whenever he pointed out, he said, hey, why don't you have the immigration sticker on your car? And uh, I said, well, no one told me I needed that. He said, you follow me. And so my wife said, what are we doing? I said, well, we got to follow him to jail. And so you can imagine the, uh, uh, think of it with you, with your, with, with your wife or whomever in the car with you. <laughs> oh, that's the last thing I'd ever need. Yeah. Uh, for, uh, you've for... been on a long drive and then now you got to go to Mexican jail. I'm going uh, to jail over turtles. What am I so, doing with this guy? Yeah. Uh, right. And, uh, we're there and I'm hearing just about every type of a new, new levels of profanity from my sweet, sweet wife. And, uh, <laughs> And I was just told to shut up. You just, It'd almost be better if he put you in cuffs and took you out of the car. Yeah. You got us. Uh, you got us into enough here. So we're there, and she's going back and forth, and they're talking and stuff and everything, and we ain't getting anywhere. And uh, he's thinking of. I know he's thinking about how much to charge us or put us in jail, whatever. And uh, so then I just thought, you know what? I should just screw with these people right now. <laughs> so I said, my darling, my love, stop talking. Can't you see? Look, this is Officer Garza. He is the leading supreme legal authority with us right now in Mexico. And baby, he's telling us it ain't the time for you to go see the birthplace of your mother. It ain't the time for me to fulfill <laughs> my lifelong dream of seeing these turtles in Cuatro Cienegas. Don't you see that Officer Garza is not only talking to us as a legal representation, he's also serving as a messenger from God. And that you could have heard a pin drop. What? And... Uh, they both just stopped and turned and looked at me <laughs> and, and I started to continue on and, and uh, with all this nonsense and the guy was just sitting there like this and he goes, oh, just get the hell out of here. I don't want to see the two of you ever again. Just go. And so with that, we went and we were uh, about five miles from the place and we get pulled over by another cop. And uh, she said, what do we do? I said, let's just get out of the car at the same time, approach them smiling and friendly, and, and let's just keep jabbering to them at the same time. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my mother-in-law was born in a town just outside of Cuatro Cienegas. So she just starts yammering, 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 and I'm going on, and we're both just going turtles and mama and mama and turtles. <laughs> and, all this and he goes, man, I'm so glad you guys are here, sir. I don't know anything about the turtles. Those people up there do. Uh, ma'am, welcome back home. Uh, y'all just get that sticker next time before you come down here. <laughs> so we get to Quattro Cienegas and, uh, they're closed and I go in and I, I, I just start banging on the gate and, uh, guy working there said, man, we're closed. Get lost. And I said, come on, man. I drove all the way from Texas and I just want to see some turtles. And he goes, yeah, but we're closed. You got to go. I said, well, how are you getting home? Oh, well, I'm going to go walk to the bus stop four miles down the street and blah, blah, blah. just let us in, dude. We'll take you home. So <laughs> we got in. And then after that, we were driving back and we got to the border and they uh, told us that uh, we just declared war on Iraq. And one minute later, we'd been stuck sealed in Mexico. So uh, there you go. If you got to uh, go to Cuatro Cienegas, uh, it's only about a three or four hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> not from us <laughs> did, well from did, Del Rio <laughs> did you end up seeing them there did oh you, yeah, yeah was yeah, that yeah, your yeah. first time that was the first time yeah yeah the second time I took some students with me we were collecting uh specimens and it was about oh three or four years later and uh you know we we went driving through there and they had a big military uh, uh, inspection point. And we had our personal belongings and stuff in the vehicle as well. And I wanted to get through, I didn't want to be harassed by the, uh, the, the military. And I didn't want them rummaging through our stuff or anything like that either. Uh, so we pulled over and they, they wanted to search the cars. And I, I walked up to a couple of soldiers and I said, Hey guys, Y'all want to be really careful with those two suitcases right there. I said, why? Well, I got to tell you, I don't really know these two guys, but I don't think their moms taught them how to clean their asses. 
and they've been just eating all kinds of bad food here, and uh, you don't want to go in those suitcases. And they just backed up. I said, all right, you guys get out of here. And then I said, wait, wait, wait. Uh, do you all know how to get to the trails up on that mountain over there? And they said, yeah, go down, and there's a cattle trail, and your, your truck will make it. And uh, they said, I tell you what, whenever you're coming back, if you find any snakes, would you stop and show them to us? And uh, we'd like to see them. So we kept our word on that. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just you you kind of go through these things. And, and uh, well, I guess I'm lucky I've got some stories and I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Were the, were the bags that supposedly had the soiled clothes, were those the bags with the turtles? No, we, oh, we, okay. uh, we stuffed those. Uh, we surgically implanted those in some dogs. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like actually uh, listening. Like, okay, what'd you do? It is Mexico, you know? <laughs> but uh, no, no. We uh, actually, let me grab one of the turtles I brought back from there. Please do. That's great, I've got, right? I've got two of them. And uh, uh, the second trip I did, there was a restaurant in Cuatro Cienegas. And uh, they had these mesquite carved box turtles. Oh, wow. Look at that. So hand carved. And this one's a male. So he's got a nice little indention there on the plastron right there. <laughs> That's the really first, cool. Uh, little bitty baby right here, oh, too. Oh, wow. So uh, we bought every one that they had in the restaurant. I love those because they actually resemble those specific species that oh, you know really the area cool. is known for as opposed to just like a cartoony turtle, right? Like yeah, that's a box yeah, turtle. Yeah. That's cool. So these are the box turtles I brought back from Quattro Cienicus. Oh, there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> I thought you said you were taking back samples. Was I lie? Did I lie? No. We didn't Did have we had like some stuff, but uh, you know, it, it's just a basic thing, man. I don't care if they're soldiers or if they're cops or whoever, but if you got people rummaging through all of your stuff, yeah. uh, you got to keep an eye on them so things don't mm -hmm. go missing. And uh, yeah. so just being able to keep it lively and uh, friendly has been yeah. very, very helpful. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I learned that in our time with, with, you know, working with NAFTURG and the, and the TSA, like when you're out doing samples and I'm, and this is, you know, within the U S so nothing really exciting necessarily, but you know, when someone's looking at you, like, what the hell are you guys doing? Just give them a wave and a smile and act like you're supposed to be there. And well, I was told know. that what you do is you'd carry a butterfly net with you. <laughs> and that way, if you, if you see something on another side of a fence and you hop the fence and, uh, uh, a car starts coming, you just start running and swinging that butterfly net at an invisible butterfly. <laughs> Nobody's going to stop and talk to a grown man running through a field <laughs> swinging a butterfly net. <laughs> <laughs> Try That's that. Terrific. I heard it works. I haven't tried it, but I heard it works. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that so much. We're going to film Anthony doing that for the intro. I'm I'm in. I, I like that even more now because it'll be like an inside joke at that yeah, time that definitely. Carl mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Definitely. We'll get over there. <laughs> so are we getting uh, into our first feature? Yeah, I got some questions. Our only feature. Our only, only feature. feature. Tonight. Yeah, our only feature mm -hmm. tonight because it's all we just want it to be all Carl because it should yeah. be. Yeah. Oh. Minto's mailbag. There it is. All right, so here are the questions. The first one is uh, based on what you were talking about earlier. You were saying how museums are probably the most important aspect of, you know, so we can keep, you know, information going. Um, you, I was led to believe in the past, and I'm not sure how, that's what I'm asking, but do you keep wet specimens, correct? Uh, yeah, museums uh, uh, ideally have both, wet and dry. And so mm -hmm. the dry ones would typically be uh, skeletons. Okay. And, but you personally keep some? I have, uh, yeah, we've got a, uh, we've started a uh, collection of specimens because whenever we're out in the field, we, we commonly come into things like, well, if you're doing turtle work, uh, it's not going to be surprising to find like, you know, where raccoons get together and leave a midden of shells. And so being able to just salvage even shells or uh, roadkill, getting roadkill specimens, a lot of times you can find things that are in pretty good shape to where you don't have to sacrifice the turtle. With uh, live specimens we capture, uh, we pretty much only, the only thing we take from those is uh, some tissue samples. And so it could be like a little bit of skin or a little bit of blood. 
uh, sometimes a toenail, depending on what's needed. But uh, uh, yeah, it's good to have the reference material. Yeah, sorry if I gave a long-winded answer. No, no that's please perfect. do. That's perfect. It ties Longer into my better. next question. Yeah, it ties into my next question. Um, you're a published author. Uh, so which books would you say were like the toughest for you to either research or write? And then what also would be like your favorite book that you think, you know, some of our viewers would check out? The one I, if, if, if it's kind of like, to come from like a thing like, a, uh, which one I would prefer to be known by <laughs> <laughs> would be the box turtle book. And, uh, a, uh, that one right there. Yeah. There you go. That one right there. That, Let them know, because, Kev. That book is just thin enough to where you can open it halfway and it will hold open just about any size door. <laughs> and so it's a really good door stop. But uh, yeah, that's what I use it for. You know? right, oh, good. don't you uh, dare. No, that one was, uh, that was, that was, that was neat. And, uh, you know, one of the things too, is that 20 plus years ago, I'd mentioned, you know, some, uh, my appreciation of box turtles to co to, to coworkers. And some of the guys just sort of laughed at it because, uh, they were just still that common in the pet trade. And, uh, they, there really wasn't anything that was, uh, as widely appreciated, uh, regarding box turtles as they are now. And it's really refreshing. I would look at these things and think, good grief, man, these are amazing looking animals. And, uh, you can still go to some of the flea markets and, uh, get them for super cheap and just stacked up like cordwood. Uh, that right there ended pretty much by around 2000. So, uh, the last of box turtles here in Texas being sold really cheap like that, that, that I can tell you, uh, it was in the, it was in the early two thousands. And I think it's a good thing that it went away, uh, up until, uh, 2003, I think I, 2003 was like my peak year. 02, 03 was my peak year on producing uh, three toed box turtles. I had around 150. And um, uh, after that, I moved away from any kind of selling of any type of animal at all. I didn't have a problem with animals that, I don't have a problem with animals being captive bred and, and sold to folks that want to keep them and stuff. But just for myself, I didn't want to create any kind of confusion. Uh, with my motivation for wanting to acquire specimens and stuff. So uh, that's just me personally. But anyway, I think I moved away from the book question. So who, who, who asked that question, by the way? Uh, that, I did. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. We got a, do we got a viewer mail question here to answer? Uh, there hasn't been a lot out there. It hasn't been just listening to you. You fill up this entire podcast, just a great speaker. Okay. So everyone's been focused. Well, I want to know their name. If anybody out there is going to be writing in a question, I want to know their name and the city yeah. that coming from so because name I, I and just, city uh, yeah name of the city and the name of the of the supposed person okay <laughs> <laughs> supposed people out there let's get some questions going for carl and make sure you tell me what city you're from but uh let's see so <laughs> all right i got a question okay Who's that's, all, that's all it takes that's all it uh, takes. this is a supposed person greg uh and greg is from atlanta right or on there anthony yeah just call yeah. georgia yeah georgia all right, so he's from Georgia. Georgia. He wants to know. He really wants to know where your sleeves went. Where my sleeves went? Well, it's not even nice. You know, the thing about it is that uh, if you got to ask a question like that, son, you just ain't ready. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, you're right. <laughs> so that's that's what happened. And by the way, this is the uh, this is an official Texas Turtles uh, shirt. Oh. And if yeah. you'd like some of this fine couture to sport, you can visit texasturtles.org and uh, place your order online, and we'll get a shirt out to you. Uh, the sleeveless version is do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to ask. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> Kev, you're looking so, like you have another one. Yeah, yeah. They, now they're pouring in. Now they're pouring in. People, Everybody just for just the focused. record, we do this every show, guys. Yeah. You know that you can just start with the questions even before the show starts. I don't know why. We have to remind. We should start every show by asking. It only took us 70 yeah. shows to realize that we should do this. Okay, great. I did write it in the beginning, so. Oh, thanks, Kev. I see you're on you top of it. You got it, buddy. At Always. Least you are. Okay. All right. So uh, this is from Evans, Turtles, and More. Uh, I don't know where he's from, but he wants to uh, know, Carl, if you still keep and breed anything personally. 
Uh, regardless for sales or not for sales, but you know. right, 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 right. So uh, to answer that, yes, and uh, uh, the the only thing that uh, has really been bred and, and what what was the what was the name of the person asking the question again? Uh, it's Evans Turtles and more. Evans Turtles. So could this be Evan? It's more than likely Evan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe right, stage so name, but more than likely. Evan, talking to you, brother. Uh, the last thing that we had, uh, the last project where we wanted to have things that were captive bred for it, uh, I do maintain a number of fox turtles. And uh, these have been animals that were acquired uh, mostly through uh, old people who had their pets that they had for decades and could no longer care for. And uh, some of these collections, you're able to get animals that you know the general locality that they came from, or at least the county. And so there is a, uh, uh, a project that's local where they're actually trying to do some soft releases of box turtles back into the wild. And what that means is they take captive red turtles and uh, they take the turtles and you take the babies and you raise them up in an outdoor enclosure uh, until they're big enough to where they can be fitted with a radio transmitter. And you raise them up like this in these sort of naturalistic uh, conditions and then you release them there. And the place where you're raising them up at is out in the field. And the idea is that you're going to get these animals uh, uh, palmed in on that place where that's going to be their home. And then hopefully establish themselves. Because uh, uh, box turtle numbers are nothing what they used to be. Uh, for myself, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an old guy now because I can tell you about how box turtles were common. And uh, when me and my brother would go riding around bikes and stuff or whatever, finding box turtles in neighborhoods and stuff like that, it was still an ongoing thing. And uh, it was it was the, uh, of course, you got habitat loss, you got cars, but you also had un, uh, just wide open commercial collecting. And uh, that took a big toll. So we've got some box turtles that are going into a program like that right now. Uh, and there are other people, private landowners that are interested in trying this out as well. And so that right there is uh, uh, one of the species that uh, I do breed. I don't do it with really any intention. I have uh, groups of box turtles that live together. And so they're out there just living their lives. And uh, the, I don't even bring any eggs in to incubate them. I just uh, go out usually after the first uh fall rain or spring heavy downpours and and just go out and just start picking up these little little baby box turtles out from like a little turtle garden if you will mm -hmm. and uh recently i've given away and, and that's what i do is I, I i'll give them away to folks if if there's people that are competent on keeping a box turtle uh you know we don't texas doesn't allow the sale of uh uh native turtles and so I don't have any problem at all with giving away the box turtles to people who are able to take care of them. But uh, aside from uh, the box turtles, it would be the Zulia toadhead. And uh, that's a species right there that uh, uh, there was a publication in Reptilia magazine, I think, in 2011. And uh, by a Venezuelan fellow that took care of a pair and, and bred them in captivity. But... Uh, that's also around the time that, that I bred those turtles as well. So I'd say he and I, it's a coin toss as to who bred them first, you know. But uh, uh, right now, that's that's pretty much it. I've got animals that have been given to me by zoos, surplus turtles. Uh, there's uh, here and there, there's things that, that uh, TSA needed homes to be provided for turtles. So there you go. So two species that I actually uh, do anything with to breed. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, wait a minute. I got paid <laughs> got spotted turtle. Uh, 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 an acquaintance of mine passed away, and I inherited his spotted turtles, and those breed. So there you go. Okay. Awesome. Uh, you should put a stipulation on, like, the turtle that you gave away for free that they have to either have your book or have to buy it, you know, that showed that they have well, that access I, there. I, I have it to where they, they got to have somebody that can vouch for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to run into any kind of uh, – malfeasance with the law on anything regarding okay, I gotcha. commercial trade because the way they define it is is that it's not just money for product it could be money goods or services rendered you know so uh I'd, and then plus you know it's just like you feel like you kind of 
sticking it to the evil empire on uh, <laughs> on giving them away because then you're you're taking that much less. Or you're, I don't know if it impacts the black market at all. I, I have no idea. But uh, that's something right there that uh, with Texas turtles that uh, touching onto the black market. Uh, and by the way, Evans turtles, thanks for the question. Uh, but discussing the black market and the problems with that with turtles here in uh, the Lone Star State is uh, uh, directly with alligator snappers. And, uh, you know, one of the things that a lot of people that do turtle work have concerns about is that you don't want people necessarily knowing where your turtles are at that you're studying because they'll go and you could have animals stolen. But uh, at the same time, you want to have people excited about these animals as well. And uh, we've kind of adopted the general look, the general appearance, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the kind of general outlook that uh, the bad guys already know where to go and catch alligator snappers. Unfortunately, they do. And if you do if you do that type of work, you figure it out pretty easy. And you can even use Google Earth to to mm -hmm. plan where to go. And uh, so we kind of took the other approach. We think that if you the more we can make Texans aware of of these just these lurking leviathans, these Paul Bunyans of the turtle world, you know that they that they are here in Texas in the Lone Star State. That's just like how. We Texans are very civically minded. Uh, us good Texans are also very, very environmentally minded as well. And uh, that's something to be proud of, to have those turtles like that. So let it be known. And that way, if somebody sees someone with a pickup truck with some in the back or whatever, or this or that, there's likely more awareness to where they can uh, 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 stop it and, and help out the situation. So through the internet, that's been great. We've been able to reach out and, uh, uh, you know, spread information and all, but then also, uh, more recently we had a chance to, uh, uh, work with the one and only coyote Peterson on, uh, a couple of programs regarding alligator snappers here in Texas. And so that was really cool right there. I did need, I'd never even seen the guy's show, uh, before we worked with him. And, uh, I'd seen this, you know, this guy let himself get stung or, bit this and that and right uh, and and we were talking about it and it's something too i think that people wonder about with that there's you know and, and just to kind of dial it back a couple of decades uh when steve Irwin was out uh there was steve Irwin had just as much heat on him as coyote peterson playing sure yeah uh and and uh oh well you know he's showing people dangerous handling he's this and that and stuff you know oh he dangling a baby in front of a crocodile man who hadn't dangled a kid in front of a crocodile Show <laughs> no one i want to meet that and i'll tell them you're a liar <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh so we were discussing uh the whole thing and uh you know we realized that his audience is kids eight to ten year olds and that's the people we got to reach with this stuff if you want to make anything matter uh we're all getting old and, and we got to have young people excited about it. So, uh, we're, we're pleased to be working on that project there, uh, and being able to share information with people and stuff. That's, that's been a really rewarding experience. Awesome. To me, this makes all the sense in the world, right? People conserve what they care about and they care about what they know. And if, right, if, if we're not doing our part well, to educate people, you know, then we're not equipping them to be on the good guy side. You know, e. to join Wilson. our side and, and do the right thing. We'll talk about, uh, and, and Ernst Meyer and those guys would talk about like biophilia and how people have it. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of young people these days don't have near the outdoor experience and stuff and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But, man, they get excited over it still. And uh, uh, so it's easy to like that powder kick. I mean, look at you guys. You got this going on. <laughs> You got people tuning in and it's, it's about, uh, well tonight it's cause I'm here, but no, right. it's, <laughs> it's, Absolutely. it's, about, it's, a, it's about these animals, you know, and, yeah. uh, just how it makes everybody happy and excited. Sure. I totally agree that it's about you tonight. I'm super excited. <laughs> we have 44 active viewers right now between YouTube Ooh. and Facebook. It doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a lot for us on a regular week. You know? That is. Yeah, 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 absolutely. 
Yeah, and awesome. this is an, this goes out on audio afterwards too, uh, mm-hmm. Carl. So if you if you hate it, I'm sorry. It's it's gonna live forever. Oh, it rocks. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got a couple more questions that poured in as well. Um, so this is from uh, Nature with Gabe out of Atlanta. Uh, I'm assuming Gabe. Uh, what are your mo- what are you most excited for Texas Turtles looking into the future? Great question, Gabe. Uh, I'll tell you this, Gabe. Whenever you start going into something like this and you're and you're and you're just going after it on just all angles of curiosity, uh, you're going to find something that that gets you excited. Uh, continuing is uh, uh, getting tr- more traps in the water, seeing what we catch next, stopping at more bridges, seeing what, find out what we're going to see next, uh, what kind of observations, what are we going to come across, uh, all those things, you know, you. For for us, the stuff that we've been able to do uh, a year prior, we never had any way of predicting that it was going to happen. So it's just something that uh, uh, every year, every day, it just kind of gets better. And uh, I'm lucky for it. <laughs> so I don't know. I'd, I'd like to. Uh, uh, well, it's a lot of hubris if you think you're going to uh, settle something. Or, or establish all the facts about it and all that. But if you do something, you might provide a useful stepping stone for somebody else down the future, uh, a shoulder for them to step onto. It's <laughs> a good way of looking at it. Yeah. I, I, Gabe, I, hope I answered your question, right? I think so. I think Gabe's. Yeah. I think Gabe's really excited about your answer. If, if uh, I know Gabe, like I think I do. Uh, I a few more Gabe. questions. We'll keep going as long as you want to keep talking to us, you know? Right on, man. Uh, Let's go. So this is from Matthew Hills, and he just wants to know what's your favorite uh, box turtle species, subspecies. Oh, man. That's a big question for a box turtle, man. I'm going to add to it. I want the reason why. I didn't think you would not say it, but just in case. That is that is my least favorite question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk trash to him after for that now. That's, that's, well, Way to go, Matt. Get uh, it together, Matt. I don't know, Matt. Uh, huh. yeah. Matt, you know, they, they tried telling you in school there's no such thing as a dumb question, but boy, oh boy, Matt, here we here we are. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, oh, Matt, I'm looking at you, and I want you to know something. I took your question <laughs> to heart, and I'm serious about it. Uh, I... I could go on a list of things that I like about a lot of them, but, uh, uh, well, let's see. You know, I met somebody the other day that told me that they hated Easterns. They go, I don't like Eastern box turtles. I said, why? I just don't. I just never liked Easterns. And I said, really? There's some pretty Easterns out there. Yeah, I'm just tired of them. I don't care for them. So that, that, uh, that's the backside answer to it. I uh, gave you an opposite type of answer. Someone told me their least favorite box turtle uh that person sounds horrible a friend of mine hatched out a uh Kowelan box turtle and i said man that is an ugly turtle so <laughs> <laughs> and you know we we were we were joking around and we thought we should start a uh youtube channel called cussing at turtles and uh you just put a turtle on the screen and you just have someone's finger objectively just criticize them and use profanity. And uh, we were talking about doing that and just having an all box turtle episode. But <laughs> <laughs> that's not where I, I thought you were going to go man, with that. That's like a, and, and, and it's just, it's just, yeah, because if I saw a box turtle walking on the road, it would be uh, just as exciting anywhere. Right. You know, so or in the woods or whatnot. All right, let's get a good question this next time. <laughs> all right. Uh, so from Jason Wills, Carl, have you done any work with Texas Diamondback Terrapins? No. There we go. Next one. Another bad one. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I've I've been, I'm still still getting out. We're still getting out to places to, uh, uh, go and visit populations of them. But, uh, you know, the, uh, coast is a, a, a pretty long drive from, uh, I'm based out here in Dallas, Fort Worth. And so uh that's that's about like a six seven hour drive for that's us crazy. Out there so because texas is kind of big right yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think i could drive through like eight states in that much time 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, this is from a buddy of ours, Derek Johnson. Uh, to Carl from Derek Johnson near Pittsburgh. Uh, are there any northern species, say, that the turtle room works with that you could you wish you could work with down in Texas? No. Northern. Right. No. Uh, I did. Uh, the northern species that I did work with was back in my zoo days. I, I used to breed uh, wood turtles. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I think wood turtles are really cool. I don't have a particular desire to own any. Um, you know, I've got a little group of spotted turtles here that I take care of. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind going to visit some of these places and stuff and everything and seeing them in the wild. Uh, that's what I would prefer to do is, is go instead and find these turtles in the wild. That would be a lot for me right now in my life. That'd be, that'd be more rewarding. Have you even had that opportunity? Even if it was, even if it was with any of the people on the panel here today, <laughs> I would still have fun looking at turtles in the wild. <laughs> what was your question? Even given that fact, yeah. <laughs> have you been up here to do? Have you seen wood turtles in the wild, or I've or never seen? I've never seen a North American wood turtle in the wild. Uh, I've seen wood turtles in Mexico. I've seen them in uh, Ecuador. I've seen them in uh, Honduras. You know the rhinoclims. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, haven't seen a, a North American wood turtle in the wild yet. Oh, you should come and see us. We should do that. I'm just saying. Yeah. It would be awesome. That would be cool. Uh, from Barry Allen from Bedford, Texas. What is the largest alligator snapper that you've witnessed, and what is the largest comet snapper that you've encountered as well? All right, so let me tell you guys a story about Barry Allen. Before we go any further. <laughs> Okay, so uh, remember when I told you guys about back in the day with the uh, the Herp societies and stuff? Yeah. And we had these. Uh, I saw the announcement for the Herp Society in one of the labs at the university, and I'm telling you, no joke. I, it was a North Texas Herp Society meeting, and I went and I marked it on my calendar. And I every day I'd get across, I'd get an X. You know, I'm getting closer and closer to this and stuff. Uh, my wife and I, we were breadline and less poor back then, just poor students. And uh, no joke, we had five bucks to last us two weeks. The reason why we got to eat is because I worked at a restaurant on campus and I was able to get food. But uh, uh, <laughs> I walked a half mile to that November uh, Herp Society meeting and it was cold rain. And uh, I got there. And uh, Barry Allen was uh, Barry was the sergeant at arms for the Herb Society. So he's the guy that's there. The, you know, you know, if you'd some knucklehead or or, or street looking person, uh, none shall pass. And uh, uh, I remember he told me to beat it because I didn't have money. It, and, and, and I'm telling you, man, the, the Herb Society, the room, it had like at least 130 people in it. All the seats were taken. People standing in the aisles, sitting in the aisles, you know, to see this talk. And uh, uh, I didn't have the non-membership fee. I couldn't afford it. It was two dollars. I couldn't afford two bucks. And uh, and so I tried looking in the window, and and uh, Barry told me get lost. And I was like, Dad, gum it. And uh, the flip side of that is that uh, about seven, eight months later, I was invited there as a speaker. <laughs> and then Barry started started treating me okay. And so for Barry's question, uh, the largest alligator snapper that we've gotten, uh, Barry in our backyard, uh, the largest AST that we've gotten uh, that immediately comes to mind was this past March at 108 pounds. And uh, the largest AST that was uh, got by... Uh, the crew down in Houston with our buddy Eric Muncher, uh, that was El Gigante. And that that animal came in at 135 pounds. Uh, there was two turtles that were recovered from uh, poachers from Louis Sulphur, Louisiana, that were coming to Texas and stealing our turtles. And uh, one of those was reported at 175, but uh, I, I don't know the veracity of that. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and just to let you guys know, it's kind of a loaded question because Barry is one of the guys that 
uh, actually uh, one of the first people to uh, find and document alligator snappers at uh, a location that's one of our study sites. And I think, uh, Barry, if I got it, if I remember correctly, you guys did that back in like 1992 or 95 or somewhere back then. Uh, but uh, the cool thing is, is that that was the first documentation of uh, these big mega turtles in a, a metropolitan uh, part of the river up here. And they're still going strong. And we got uh, the first one we caught whenever we started trapping out there was a baby or about a year old specimen. So that to me is finding a year old specimen is uh, uh, just as exciting as fighting a big giant one. Thanks for tuning in, Barry. <laughs> uh, what kind of work is being done regarding smooth soft shells in Texas? Uh, we're going out and taking pictures of them. Next question. Okay. No, <laughs> no uh, uh, smooth soft shells in Texas. Okay, so something that people could uh, understand out there is that if, uh, if you look at like the knowledge of, of what each state has about their turtles, it could even be about their butterflies or whatever. Uh, there's so much out there that isn't known and, uh, hasn't been documented before and smooth soft shells. I am, Ooh, man. Uh, aside from their distribution in Texas, I'm not aware of, uh, any other publication, regarding them in the state nothing uh there's 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 papers that have come out from uh arkansas uh that was one that just stuck to mind uh there's been some publications i think from oklahoma as well on them and of course other states but uh here in texas man that's that's wide open territory that uh mississippi map turtles uh you know we got uh peter lindman has done a great job of illuminating our awareness of uh uh a lot of our map turtles here in Texas and uh, even the Texas Cooter. Uh, but we've still got a lot of holes in our knowledge, you know. Uh, a lot of the fine details are not known. For example, Mississippi maps in Texas, I'm not aware of any systematic uh, 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 ecological study done. And so that's all stuff that over the course of, of years of continuing going out and uh, uh, just bits and pieces of knowledge. You can hopefully live long enough to where you adhere all those together to where it could be something useful for people to learn from. Okay. Did I answer the question or did I just ramble? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have, he asked it. I'd say so. Yeah, I have a... I, I prefer Bones the ramble. Season. Can I yeah. say that? I prefer the ramble if, if we get that. Like when it goes longer, I like that more. Definitely. I just want to listen to Carl. Um, I think this would be a good one for, to ramble for, from. Excuse me, Tyler Bowman coming from Houston. What's the highest month of activity for alligator stabbing turtles? And what's something you've learned about the species that's shocked you the most? Great questions. <sighs> Okay. Uh, we get a lot of good activity in the, in the spring, of course, April, April, and then again in the fall, September and October are, are typically really good months. You can have good months. Uh, you can have good times in May. The, uh, the biggest challenge to some of the study sites is uh, water levels. You can, uh, uh, that can really, really affect the way that you set traps. And uh, I know that Eric down in Houston has a, a huge chore. Keep it, and and the, the Buffalo Bayou area, is the water levels over there just change constantly. So he's, he's got to always keep his head you know, ready and, and on where to run traps and stuff. Uh, at one of our study sites, the, uh, a significant amount of rain can cause it to be flooded uh, for a month. So... Those are things that can challenge some of it, but the activity months are, I'd say, April, May, maybe part of March, uh, and then of course in the fall are good ones for it. The most shocking thing is, uh, uh, I guess it's not a shocking thing at all. It's uh, it's just a reality thing, and you got to grab some of these uh, so that they're not sensational, and then you can try to help provide a solution to it but the uh louisiana needs to change its laws plain and simple mm -hmm. uh 
Louisiana is is uh, a wide open laundering state for turtles, mm-hmm. and uh, so what that means is is that if you have a state that does not have protection for a particular species, sure. and the neighboring states are protecting that that organism, then that means that the bad guys can come in from the open yep. state, steal stuff, and sell it or keep it in their state because yep. there's no way of proving where it come from, and. Uh, so that has been a problem. Uh, and on the same token, uh, you know, I, 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 I've met a good number of people that are turtle hunters. And uh, a lot of these guys really do uh, like the turtles. And uh, I don't agree with, uh, uh, I don't even see any reason to eat them at all. Uh, but I think you got to be patient and you got to be open minded uh, and stand your ground on, on where you are. But if you uh, wind up being completely shut off from somebody, you're not going to be able to affect any kind of change. Right. Uh, so that's that's that aspect of it right there. As far as shocking goes, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's cool stuff. I mean, but I don't know what to think of as far as shocking. Um, cool works. Uh, let's see. Anytime you pull that trap out of that water, or even if you don't, if you catch one by hand, uh, if you see one, uh, especially catching them by hand, there's always that, that moment of trepidation where, where you just got to realize that you're going to have to jump and, and grab it good, uh, because you don't want it to grab you. But, uh, there's that part of it. But man, it just sure is neat and exciting to find them, and uh, uh, you just learn so much more out of out of all the ones that you you come across. You know, uh, one of the things we started noticing, and I don't know the reason for this, and so I have a real simple explanation, uh, is that tongue color. Alligator snapping turtles are known to have this lure. They're famous for having the the worm like lure in their mouth, and a lot of them are pink, but. I think that's only about maybe half of them. We find we find a lot of them that the uh, the color of the lure is like the color of mud. And if you're in a, a completely murky environment and stuff, fish are still going to feel vibrations and move towards things. Uh, whenever we catch turtles, sometimes we'll hold them for up to 72 hours, and that's uh, a lot of mostly just a passive way to stay eating. And whenever alligator snappers take a crap, it's always uh, an insight. Uh, <laughs> we had, uh, you know, we, we've gotten a lot of neat things from uh, turtle poop. And uh, with alligator snappers, we've gotten big, giant masses of pecan shells and acorns and uh, bits of plant and everything else. So uh, that kind of, I, I really view those turtles as omnivores. Uh, they'll eat... Uh, animals and things too but uh they just eat so much different stuff out there and so i i guess all of it's kind of cool so sorry man i don't have anything really shocking to tell you uh the uh no sorry it's all i think the fact that you're finding acorns is kind of shocking you know i would never have thought that can i make a quick analogy so i'm huge right and i love to eat and obviously but you can only be so fussy if you want to feed this well-oiled machine, right? So take me like a Chipotle, give me double meat, double wrap, two, two, you know, uh, two wraps on that thing. Every single type of salsa there is, every single type of bean there is. Like just throw everything on there because I really want to be full and I want – if I'm going to spend my money to get something special like Chipotle, then I want to make sure I leave feeling like I ate, Right. So when you have to feed that large turtle body of yours as an alligator snapper, you're going to be more opportunistic and take what you can get and take what there's a lot of. And at certain times of year, there's more plants, there's acorns, acorns falling. It makes sense to me. Even with uh, soft shell turtles, we find uh, uh, we got a uh, sample uh, from one large female this year that had uh, uh, maple seeds. Or I'm sorry, elm seeds, not maple seeds, elm seeds. And, uh, you know, so she was just going along and just eating everything that was on the surface. Just, well, this might feed me. I'll try it out. Uh, we've watched map turtles, female map turtles known for eating mussels, 
we've watched them eat cottonwood seeds uh, blowing out onto the water before. So that, and then uh, the fun part is you get these seeds and you try to see if they germinate. But the the weirdest seed that we've gotten has come from china berries, and uh, china berries are toxic and uh, they can they can poison people. And uh, birds have been known to intentionally eat them uh, to get drunk or to get uh, a little messed up. And so with turtles eating them, I have no idea if there's any level of hedonism going on with that activity or if it's just, you know. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So uh, I don't know if it bothers their stomach or anything at all. It must not with the number of uh, the seeds that we repeatedly find them. So. That's well, so like, for instance, right with box turtles, they can eat, like, poisonous mushrooms. It doesn't affect them, right? But I've read stories that people have eaten the box turtles that have eaten the mushrooms and then died. Yeah, that was from uh, – that story is the one I think you're talking about. is the one that's in Archie Carr's Handbook of Turtles from 1952. And right. uh, it's been reprinted a lot. But, yeah, the right. story was that uh, some boys had cooked uh, some box turtles in a brush fire. And then they all got sick after eating them. But uh, he also mentions that other box turtles, sorry, I think it was the, uh, I, I don't have the book in front of me right now. Wait, yes, I do. Uh, I can't remember which species of box turtle it was that he said made, uh, made good table fare. But it might have been the, uh, for the delicious box turtle. <laughs> I can't remember which one it is. I'll find it. And that's something, too, is that uh, culturally it's good for people who like turtles to understand that uh, their oldest affiliation with with, with humans was uh, being served. And, uh, right. you know, so one of the perspectives that if you read uh, some of the publications by Archie Carr, uh, they, they talk directly about uh, the flavor of a lot of the turtles, too. So... Uh, I know it, it, it's going to sound harsh to some people, but that is a very uh, long time thing with our species and turtles. So yeah. it's just one of the realities. But anyway, we can move along while I search for this bit of useless trivial knowledge. Uh, that works. <laughs> as, as to which uh, box turtle Archie Carr said uh, he heard tasted good. The the um, Pope book, I, I think it's 1939. I think that's Turtles of the U.S. and is it Turtles of the U.S. and Canada? The same title as the um, newer book? Anyway, um, it, like the first line in the book is the turtle is most familiar to us in its liquid form. Just, you know, because at that time, 1939, that's what they were known for. They were just mm-hmm. soup. Yep. You've turtles used that quote soup. before. I have, yeah. I, I love yeah. it. I use it in my... Um, in my educational uh, talks, I, I like yeah. to start with that just to show people because I, that's not the case anymore. But even when, you know, my father was a kid, he would tell me about how he would catch turtles to, you know, to sell to folks in restaurants to make turtle soup and things. It's not now if you see that on a menu, it's like, oh, my gosh, is that really turtle soup? You know, but, you know, it was the Gulf Coast box turtle. And oh. uh, he has it under economic economic importance. According to lodging, this box turtle is often eaten in Alabama and, quote, makes an excellent dish. Other things being equal, its relative larger size would make it more suitable for such use than any of the other box turtles. That was my immediate thought (laughs) when you said Gulf Coast. Like, okay, well, that's a bigger meal. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move along. Let's talk about about something else then. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh, So... We don't have any more questions online. I do have one more question. Uh, is there any species of turtle, or really any animal, actually, you know, because I'm just curious, uh, that you haven't worked with, that you haven't seen, that you are you need to see before you go? Dang. Wow. Yeah. That's rough, Well, if, if that's the condition on Not going, tomorrow. I'll have a list for you in five minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like your bucket list animal. Yeah, I'd like to see some whales. I'd like to see some elephants. Uh, that'd be cool. I hadn't seen either one of them. I've seen parts of dead whales, but uh, uh, those in the wild would be really cool to see. Uh, some of the deep sea fish, the angler fish and all, and the bioluminescent uh, species, that would be really cool. Um, but uh, 
man. So no, that's one of those. That's one of those like, which is my favorite one kind of question. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> what about you? What's your? What would you want to see? Yeah, okay. Kind of. Oh, uh-huh. you know what? Yeah, no, I, I can do this it's all day. Not so easy, I, is it? No, no, I'll, I'll tell you a million different things. You know, um, <laughs> I, I want to get to the Galapagos. I want to get to Aldabra. I want to see these animals like in in the wild. You know, where they're on, the only place they're actually at. Uh, any, any animal that's endemic to an area, that's, that's what I would want to see because I don't have that opportunity. I can't just, you know, drive to the next town over and see something, you know, uh, fortunately, while it's not in the wild, you know, Anthony lives very close to me. So there's a lot of species that I'll never be able to see if he didn't live there. Um, that's, I'm very happy about that, you know, but outside of, outside of turtles, uh, I want to see koalas and kangaroos and it just sucks that like billions of animals just died in Australia, you know, from fires. Well, had you been out there pickling koala bears, you could have been going to the museum <laughs> to look at them. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just I, the uh, the animal. There was one that uh, really stuck with me, and uh, uh, I got really lucky that it worked out. Whenever I was ten years old, uh, speaking of Archie Carr, he did this book by the Time Life series of reptiles, and in the early section of the book, he shows a photograph or two of a. Uh, an ajolote, the bipes biporus, uh, the Mexican mole lizard. And so I just thought, man, that is the craziest looking thing in the world. And whenever I was a kid, that was the only information was just a, a few paragraphs about it in that book. Uh, then uh, later on, when I got in the zoo field, you know, talked to some people and then uh, they said, yeah, you know, we had some of those things. Uh, uh, they lived on the countertop there for a couple of years, but they suck. You know, so we, and I said, like, God, come on. Actually, uh, well, I won't name names. It said that, but, uh, uh, I, I just still wanted to work with them. And so whenever I was at the working in the zoo, uh, they'd ask, well, what would you guys, there you go. That's the animal. What would you guys like to work with? And, uh, bipes was the, uh, was the, uh, thing that I always said. And, um, it wasn't until 2000 that I got to see them in the wild. And my wife and I drove from Arlington, Texas to La Paz, Baja, California, to attend the SSAR conference out there. And uh, uh, we met up with a fellow that started a serpentarium in town. Uh, his name was Abe Blank. And uh, it's just wild. There's this out of nowhere, we get there, and there's this fantastic, beautiful serpentarium. And uh, this guy from that lived in Texas and California was into herpin and falconry and all this stuff and loved bugs and everything. And 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 uh, he was a millionaire or a really loaded rich guy. And uh, uh, his the, the way he got his fortune was his grandfather. No, it's yeah. His grandpa was the first guy to start getting popcorn in the movie theaters in the United States. And wow. so he 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 got a. Uh, inheritance, whatever. Anyway, uh, he told me, he goes, Hey, if you want to find bipes, go to this little town over here and ask for this one old man. And this old man, uh, I visit with him every now and then, and he's always collecting firewood and he'll, he'll tell you where to find the bipes. And so my wife and I, uh, we went driving off and I had the, the Roger Stebbins, uh, field guide with me. And uh, we pulled up to a couple of cowboys on their horses, and uh, I rolled down the window, and I said, good afternoon. You know, I'm a biologist, and I, I study lizards, and I'm looking for this one right here. And their faces twisted in disgust. And they got off there. One guy rode his horse around to the front of the car, and <laughs> then he goes, oh, you disgusting perverts. I can't believe you drove all the way from Texas just to shove something up your ass. And my <laughs> wife started laughing. <laughs> and they they heard the woman laughing and they backed up on their horses and they, they take their hats off and they go, oh my God, you're Mexican too. You should know better. Well, we we, we left, okay? And that's because uh, there, there's, a, there's an urban myth about this animal that should you uh, either not be wearing enough clothing and sitting on the ground or answering a call of nature and not being careful, that the only purpose this animal serves in life 
is to enter the human body by the most unspeakable means where <laughs> it will not only enter them, but then with its, its claws, shred them from the inside out. And, and so there's people that are, there's less and less people that, are, that, are, that buy into that myth today. But uh, most people that see them actually think that they're very curious and stuff but, and interesting. Uh, however, we went about 10 miles more and I saw a young guy walking on the side of the road and I stopped and said, hey, man. And I did my intro and, and he backed away from us and he said, mister, my uncle called me and told me you were heading this way. We're all good <laughs> people. We don't want any trouble here in town. And so then uh, I went on into town and... I uh, started asking for this old man, and this the the first person that I asked, I said, uh, "Oh yeah, he's my uncle. I'll take you to his house." And uh, we caught lizards there and stuff. And then I came back empty-handed. I didn't have any bipeds. And uh, my buddy Abe said, uh, the guy with the serpentarium, he goes, "Hey, I want you to talk to this guy. His name is Ramses Cortez, and this guy knows a lot about bipeds." And he ran a uh, junkyard, and he loved them. And I said, where does he live? And he goes, oh, on this block. And that's it, not an address. So I go <laughs> to that block, and uh, I see guys sitting out on the steps drinking beer and stuff. And, and here comes white boy into the neighborhood, you know. And I said, hey, y'all know this guy? No, get the hell out of here. And go to the next group of guys hanging out and uh, enjoying some uh, beverages Hey, I'm looking for this fella. Do y'all know him? Nope. And one guy said, I do, because he's me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he took me out, and we right away started finding bipeds. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to finally get all the permits together and stuff in 2010, bring a back. But uh, uh, it sure has been a lot of fun doing this stuff, and I really, I really enjoy seeing that other people like it too. And uh, – uh, I don't know. I don't know if we're running out of time or anything. I took my glasses off so I wouldn't see these little messages that pop up. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. That's the best way. That's the best way. You don't want to add all these, this, this inter-host chat that we have going have, on all the time. It no, confuses I, it, everybody. Yeah. Talking about yeah. All I, I'm used to seeing blurry stuff without glasses. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it is your, your, uh, internal clock was right. We are, probably longer or getting up to probably as long as we've ever gone in the 70 episodes, but that's because you're Woo! just, yes, of course, of course, well-deserved and, and earned. And, uh, yeah. So this has just been such an awesome time talking to you. And yeah. I feel like we can, we can and should and need to have you back at some point so we could talk some more if, if you'd be okay with that. I'm down but, with it. Oh, just Carl, awesome. I can, I can tell you that there's been a lot of people in the show that I've been very fond of, you know, and, you're the most fluid speaker that we've had on here. And I come on every single month. You want, I'll get off. You can just get on and be the host. <laughs> that sounds good. I don't know if that's one of his goals though. You guys, I, I think that what you guys are doing is, is, uh, yeah, I don't know if you've ever sat around patting each other on the back, but you, you ought to at least a little bit. And, uh, just because what you're doing right now is the norm for a lot of people that have these interests and, and stuff. And, uh, for someone like myself that saw the Herp Society's decay and go away with the, the internet and stuff, it, it sure is neat to see this continuing like this. Uh, so you guys deserve to uh, uh, brag to yourselves uh, a lot, I think. And then also the uh, having the material out like what you guys do in the Turtle Room, I think is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, there was nothing like that. Of course, you guys know that. There was nothing like that years and years ago. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that I think that has brought a lot of uh, like-minded people together to where they can, they can learn and uh, appreciate, enjoy, and explore what it is that they're obsessed with and curious about. So thank you all for uh, having me on. That means so much, really. That's, that's awesome, really. Um, just a reminder for everyone, if, if you're interested in, in donating or supporting or learning more about Carl and his work, check out texasturtles.org. Um, get yourself one of those t-shirts, uh, with the sleeves or, or without, but just you sell them without? they don't, he doesn't, he already answered that. I don't, uh, because sorry. you know, whenever you're cutting sleeves off a shirt, you could do it wrong. 
<laughs> it's and, true. And if I if I if I damaged any merch, I'd get yelled at. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. Speaking of merch, uh, the Turtle Room. It's that time of year. The Turtle Room and the TSA together, um, as we do every year with that calendar. Um, they are available for pre-orders right now. Um, that's the cover of the calendar this year. Beautiful, beautiful photo for the cover. And we're very excited about that. So there you go. The turtle room.org slash shop. Yeah. Pre-orders, you get it cheaper. Yeah, you do. Get you on get it. Dollar off. Dollar off hey, for the pre-order. Great, great Christmas present for all your friends and family. Really? Well, maybe yeah. not all of them, but... <laughs> You know. <laughs> I've given them to non-turtle people. They they yeah. at least seem excited, you know, to your face, even if they're lying. So I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Steve yeah. says he's had non-turtle people buying them already this year. There you go, Steve. Those are virtual the high five. Across America, that are <laughs> <laughs> getting ready for people coming for jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Full circle. Full, full Definitely. Circle. Oh, Carl, you can make fun of my book any day of the week, my friend. Okay. I loved it. Thank so you so guys, much for coming on. Thank you all. And peace out, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Deuces.